First of all, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Steve Shorey, and I'm a staff attorney at the Public Records Division. And you'll see another woman uh, working with me as well. Her name is Cassandra Chung, and she also works in the Public Records Division. And as you all know, this is a hearing about the proposed regulations regarding the updated Public Records Law. So we are here to welcome any oral or written testimony that you have about these proposed regulations. Um, we're not here today to answer any questions. Um, so my job really is just to listen to your comments and relay them to the supervisor. We will incorporate any and all comments um, into any updated regulations that we promulgate. We're hoping to do that by the end of the year. So with that being said, just a little bit of procedural matters, we'll go by whoever is um, listed first on the sign-in sheet for oral testimony, and we'll go from there. As you can see, we have this table set up for if, if any panels want to speak. So feel free to come up here and sit down and uh, give whatever testimony you have about these proposed regulations. In the meantime, we're, as you can see, we're, we're going to try to accommodate it for all the people coming here, uh, which is great to see a big turnout like this. So that being said, Let's get started with the first person who's on the list, and if Cassandra, you could just uh, let me know who that person is. Sean Robertson. All right, sure. Well, come on up. Actually, one member of the two-person panel I have with me. Yeah. Okay, great. Hopefully, you have enough space there to move those back. We can always uh, move those forward. We <laughs> won't have to be centered. All right, that's fine. Feel free to start anytime you're ready. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, John Robertson. I'm the legislative director from the Massachusetts Municipal Association, and I'm joined by attorney Kevin Bach, representing the Massachusetts Municipal Lawyers Association. We have brief comments uh, to make today at this hearing. Uh, our comments are going to be supplemented by detailed written testimony that we're going to leave with you. Um, I also have uh, written comments from the small town administrators of Massachusetts that I'm going to leave with you. Uh, this group represents town managers and administrators from the many small towns in Massachusetts, particularly in the western part of the state. I want to start by, by simply saying thank you for taking action on these regulations in advance of, of January 1st, when the rules take effect. Uh, bringing clarity to the process is going to be critical in getting started on the right foot and avoiding Fusion. The MMA and the MMLA have spent a lot of time since June when Chapter 121 was, was signed, um, educating city and town officials from around the state on the significant new obligations they face and telling them that they have to be ready to go on January 1. Uh, we have answered a lot of questions, often some very detailed and fact-specific questions, as best we could. Uh, these regulations are the subject of the, of the hearing today are very important in that they can bring clarity to a complex new law. Uh, Chapter 121, among other things, uh, requires the appointment and training of new municipal officers, record access officers. Uh, it provides a tight new schedule of timelines for response to requests, compliance, and appeals. It includes a significant limitation on fees with provisions for appeal. And it provides um, significant new penalties cities and towns for, for non-compliance. There are a couple of provisions um, in the regulations that I want to touch on briefly. Um, there's more detailed discussion of these in our, our written testimony uh, before I turn it over to Kevin. One of them is the rules governing frivolous or harassing requests. The new public records law clearly uh, contemplates the possibility of relief for cities and towns that are targeted by requests that are frivolous or intended to intimidate or harass. Uh, the supervisor of records is authorized to provide that relief. 
in 32.07 in the proposed regulations, a municipal records access officer may petition the supervisor of records for an extension of time or for a waiver of the obligation to provide records in response to this request. One of the things that we do ask you to take a look at in, in the proposed regulations um, is sort of a tightening up of, of what's provided for in the statute and what's provided for in, in the regulations. That we think there's some additional clarification that, that could be warranted there. And the second item I, I want to mention is the, the rules for extra time for compliance. Um, there are some of the, there is a complex schedule uh, that, that cities and towns need to, need to abide by for responding to requests and for complying with requests uh, with a set of appeals that are included in there. Some of those fall under the jurisdiction of the supervisor records uh, and some that don't. Um, we do have a, a bit of a worry that um, cities and towns will use the regulations um, sort of in their entirety to understand the full flow of the timeline. Uh, there is one particular portion of the timelines, and that's the additional 15 days that a city or town can have if there is an undue burden that a request would impose on the communities. We think there's room for some additional clarity in the regulations on that on that extra 15-day rule, particularly if how it relates to the initial 10-day uh, rule for response or compliance, and then the subsequent extra time that might be granted uh, by the Secretary of the State. So those are sort of just brief summaries of two of the items that we go into greater detail um, in, in, in the letter. Um, and at, at this point, I'll, I'll turn it over to Kevin for some further comments. Uh, thank you for having this hearing. It's very important to the Municipal Lawyers Association that are often, the municipal lawyers are often called in to assist our client towns and cities to respond to public records requests. And so we have a deep interest for ourselves and our clients that there be uh, care and precision in the regulations and that any gaps in the statute be addressed if, if, as best as can be through the regulatory process. And we think, by and large, the supervisor has done a very good job trying to do that. So I want to first congratulate the supervisor in, in, in trying to come up with a series of uh, definitions and other points um, that help us clarify uh, how we apply the law. Um, one area that I, I think you have struggled with and you've struggled with quite well is the definition of agency versus municipality. Uh, the statute only talks about agencies and municipalities and has a differential in terms of the timeline that's a, allowed to municipalities to comply, uh, a differential in the fees that can be charged by municipalities, and we believe that the legislature intended to recognize that municipalities have fewer resources and staff available to respond at least to some of the larger requests uh, that may come in than their counterparts at state agencies. And as you also recognize, there are a number of governmental ent entities that fall in between what we would think is a strict definition of municipality and what's a state agency. Um, at the moment, you've, you, you've included uh, entities like regional school districts in the definition of municipalities, and we applaud that, other local housing authorities and, and entities like that. Uh, there are inevitably going to be certain entities out there that may not know what their status is. And so we've asked in the rules that you encourage those entities to come to the supervisor for an advisory opinion, to make their case, uh, among others, charter schools. Some of them have state charters, some of them have local charters. Uh, it, it's going to be a, a tricky uh, area for them, um, uh, universities, colleges, you know, there's a host of entities that may not yet uh, come up with the definition. And in particular, counties aren't mentioned. Uh, there's only six or so remaining counties that haven't been abolished. They, like municipalities, have very small administrative staff. And so I also had uh, a particular um, submission from one of the county entities that I represent asking that counties be included in the definition of municipality. Um, beyond that, uh, we, a, 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 when we worked with the House 
a joint committee and then with the House sponsors and then with the Senate and then with the conference committee. There were some uh, clear distinctions on how requests should be made by the requester to the public entity. And the House language or the Senate language was silent on that aspect and so we think the Senate language would have remained, uh, maintained the law as it is now that oral requests are allowed as they are now. Um, we think though that the House language which was ultimately adopted by the bill which has um, records may be delivered by hand, first class mail or by electronic mail implies strongly that a written writing is required in order for the requestor to trigger this whole series of timelines and potential sanctions if there's non-compliance. We don't think it's a lot to ask of the requester to put a request in writing if that whole series of, of uh, requirements is then to be imposed upon the, the custodian of the records access officer. And we fully realize that municipalities and we suggest some language here, uh, we would be, have discretion to accept oral requests, and many of them do, whether it's birth and death certificates at the town clerk's office or building permits, you know, there's a lot of over-the-counter kind of oral requests, and I'm sure that municipalities will continue to respond to those requests fully. But where you have some oral requests that may be very confusing to the custodian, whether it's a question, being asked instead of a record <coughs> being requested, whether it's a request for information rather than a record that may exist. Custodians don't always know what's being asked of them and requesters may always not always formulate their request, if it's only in, in, in an oral form, in a, in a precise enough way to even know if the records request apparatus is then triggered. So we really think it's important to have requests in writing, in some form of writing, be it email, uh, regular mail, uh, in-hand delivery. Um, but we think that language has meaning in the House bill that was then enacted in the statute, and that allowing oral requests uh, sort of uh, overlooks the fact that the Senate and the House differ on that language. Um, we hope that you don't deem, as the current regulations have, you don't deem all custodians of records to be records access officers. That is potentially every employee of a municipality and every volunteer board member is technically a custodian of records because they receive and make records. And in the current records, or in the current regs, you have them being deemed records access officers. It's fine if they are subject to the obligations of responding to the request, but beyond that, the records access officer has to post their contact information on the website, the responsibility, the responsible for coordinating requests. So there's a whole host of RAO responsibilities that we don't think apply to custodians for merely because they're custodians. There certainly are some responsibilities for custodians too respond to the request or funnel it over to the official RAO or however that may be handled. But we think it's important to give some uh, vitality to that records access officer position. It's a new function, a new role. It'll hopefully be helpful to the public. Uh, it'll be a way to coordinate the municipality's response. And we hope that you don't confuse those two roles, the records access officer with the custodian. And finally, under um, uh, reasons to decline uh, appeals, as John mentioned, harassment and intimidation is one of those. You've also included, uh, and we applaud this, uh, declining appeals for records that relate to active litigation. That's very discretionary at the, discretionary at the moment, and we urge the supervisor to establish certain published, published standards in the regs as to what kind of litigation you might decline to hear an appeal on, and what kind of litigation you might accept the appeal. Uh, we suggest that maybe major commercial litigation that has voluminous document requests within the litigation, uh, 
that the private litigant in that situation may go beyond the rules of court to get through public records law, records that may otherwise be subject to protective order of the court. Those are the kinds of litigation that you may want to decline to hear um, appeals on. And so we ask you to look at you know, those standards so that the public, the requester community, the municipal community knows what to expect if there is an appeal of a matter that's currently in litigation. On the other hand, there may be small cases that, you know, uh, individuals representing themselves pro se that you may say, well, if they can't get public records, uh, we should really hear that appeal and, and find out why the community is withholding them. So I think there's pluses and minuses, but it would be great to have some more definition in that area. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. And I can take any, any written testimony as yeah. well. Are there any questions that anyone that you might ask? I honestly don't have any right. at this point, but we appreciate you coming in and, and oral as well as written testimony. Thank Thanks. Thanks. <clears throat> you. Okay, let me reiterate if if you haven't already and you'd like to provide some oral testimony, I'll circulate this back around, this uh, sign in sheet, and we can go from there just so we keep it organized. Um, but the next person is John Hawkinson. Thanks. Right. Thank ahead. you, Attorney Shorey, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. My name is John Hawkinson. I'm a freelance news reporter. I generally cover the municipality of Cambridge, so I look at things as a local person dealing with a municipality that has a lot of resources, uh, but isn't always very responsive under the public records law. Um, I, I guess I have some concerns with, uh, some overall concerns with how the new regulations are drafted. I, so throughout the House and Senate process, there was a lot going on, and the result was a really complicated law and a lot of complicated changes. And the regulations appear to reflect that complexity. And it would be great if the regulations could be more accessible and simpler. And I think in many ways, some of the simplicity of organization of the regulations that was available in the prior version has been lost here. And I hope some of it could come back. Uh, for instance, in the prior regulations, essentially every paragraph was preceded by a short, bold-faced uh, set of two or three words summarizing it, uh, you know, promptness of access, et cetera. Uh, in the revised regulations, uh, while some of those headings remain, there are scores of subparagraphs beneath those, and so functionally there's no longer a short, brief heading uh, in front of each paragraph of legalese, and that makes it a lot harder to find the regulation you're looking for uh, it makes it harder to understand the regulations if you just want to sit down and glance through them. And I, I realize the regulations are, are not the same as the guide to Massachusetts public records, which I'm sure your office is also working to produce in a timely fashion before the laws take effect. But uh, nonetheless, the new regulations are not as clear as the old regulations were. Uh, similarly, with respect to regulatory drafting, uh, you've renumbered several of the regulations uh, and I, I'm not sure that's always, uh, obviously if the whole thing is rewritten, uh, the numbers may not make a lot of sense. But for instance, rights of access changed from section 32.05 to section 32.07. And you know, people are going to cite rights of access, they're going to cite 32.05 in various places, and not everyone's going to update all of that. And it would be very helpful if there was consistency of numbering between the old regulations and the new ones. I think my personal concerns about the content of the regulations primarily relate to promptness of access. 
and, and you know, if you've heard me testify before the legislators, I was very concerned with the delays, uh, you know, the change from 10 days, uh, 10 calendar days to 10 business days, you know, the extension of time for custodians to respond. And to the extent that there are further delays added by the regulations, that concerns me and I hope it can be corrected. Um, for instance, uh, the prior regulations required compliance without a reasonable delay and as soon as practicable. And I realized that was really tough language to enforce, and I think in practice the supervisor's office generally declined to enforce anything other than the 10-day requirement. However, having that language in the regulations was really helpful to point to uh, custodians to and to say, look, you're supposed to respond as soon as you can. You're not. You don't have to move mountains. You have a lot of other work you can't get it done. But if you have a copy of this sitting on your desk, you're required to produce it. You can't just decide to withhold it for 10 days for political reasons. Certainly heard that. I heard, well, we'd like to send it to the city council first before we share it publicly uh, and for a document that is not subject to the deliberate process. Uh, that's you know simply not acceptable, and it's something that the regulation shouldn't encourage. And so they should not take a step backwards, as they appear to be doing, by removing the as soon as practical language. And of course, that's implementing uh, Chapter 66, Section 10's requirement for without our reasonable delay. So there is a statutory basis for that language. Uh, so I, I urge you to keep it. Um, I'm also a little concerned with 3207-2F, which prejudices electronic requests and mailed requests versus oral requests. I don't want to have to go track down a custodian in person because telephonic requests are not uh, given the same privilege in a language than they were before. I don't want to have to track down a custodian in person to get my request in one day earlier, or rather to give a one day earlier deadline. The custodian doesn't want that, and I don't want that. The regulations should not require me, if I care about getting it in 10 days rather than 11, to get that request in in person, and maybe I should be more clear. The reason is the regulation requires, or states written requests for records will be deemed received on the first business day following electronic transmission or physical receipt by the records office. An oral request will be deemed received on the day it was made. Uh, that's a step backwards. It discourages electronic communication. Uh, it really has no place in our world today, and it makes my life and other people's lives more annoying. Uh, I don't like to be an annoyance to custodians. Sometimes I feel that I am. Uh, anything that makes that worse is poor. Um, I think that's primarily my comments. Uh, there's some other deadline calculation issues that I think you've heard from others on, and uh, I'll try to put in my written remarks. I, I would also encourage you to uh, hold open the deadline for written comments till the end of the week. I, I think that would be helpful, especially given the size of the meeting here today. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that's something you can commit to. I can't quite yet. No, but I can certainly, uh, I'll check into that. Okay, and uh, I intend to submit written comments at a later time. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, uh, next on the list looks like we have a, a panel. <coughs> Bob Ambrosi. Um, Gabby Wolf and Pam Wilma. together to try to um, pass this legislation and refine it as it went through the process. And um, we uh, recognize that well, the legislation in its final form as it came to you is uh, enormously complex. And uh, I think you have done a, uh, an admirable job of trying to you know, tease out various threads. And, uh, and yet it remains, I think, a big challenge. One thing that I would like to highlight in particular that I think is challenging, um, and it has to do with the, the, some of the definitions. 
the legislature, uh, the legislation talks specifically about agencies and municipalities. And there's some discussion already about how those, uh, you know, there are maybe public policy reasons for treating those types of entities differently. Unfortunately, those, those words, as you well know, don't actually align, uh, don't appear in the statutory definition of public records and the entities that are subject to public records law. And so, uh, in order to make sure that there is as little confusion as possible for um, the records access officers and people who are responsible for replying to, responding to requests, as well as people who are making requests, I think, and I, I, unfortunately, I think you know, for the courts as well, I, it will be very important to make sure that the language of the regulations is very uh, explicitly grounded in the statutory language about who's subject to the public records law. And um, I, I want to, um, we're submitting uh, some uh, suggested edits that would help to make that uh, alignment more clear and comprehensive, and um, I'd be happy to try and you know, explain you know, in, in greater detail um, you know, if there are questions about how we try to do that. But I think that there's an opportunity and a need to um, make the, the relationship between those two terms, agency and municipality, uh, and the statutory language clearer. Um, there's one other piece that I think I'll touch on, and then maybe some of my colleagues will, will uh, focus on others. There's um, one of the pieces of the legislation and then the regulations talks about um, the ability for a custodian to deny access um, to records in response to a request where the requester has previously failed to pay for. Um, uh, you can talk about it too if you want. Is that all right? Oh, okay. I, I'm happy to, to, to let let Pam talk about that more. Um, it, it's it's an area where I think some clarity could be um, could be valuable because um, there are circumstances where we, I think we need to define very carefully what kinds of circumstances um, would lead to that kind of conclusion that somebody has failed to pay. Uh, otherwise, I'm afraid that that could be, um, could see more denials where they aren't appropriate. Okay. So, um, thank you for, for having us. Um, we do have written testimony, uh, as well as a red line of the regulations. And actually, there is more in the red line than we highlight in the testimony. Uh, and part of that was just to emphasize some of the things we thought were most important. But all of the things in the red line are things that, that we think uh, are important changes and should happen. Uh, we understand, especially in this venue, there's only certain things that we can focus on. So we sort of divided them up, and I'm going to follow up on what uh, Gabby said, although I endorse everything that all, you know, each of my colleagues uh, is saying, and this is a very important uh, opportunity to expand on and to follow the statutory language and each of these other issues are very important. Um, on the failure to pay, as Gavi started to, to say, there are a number of circumstances where we could imagine that the current language could potentially be um, uh, unclear and could result in unintended consequences. One of them is uh, a circumstance where a record access officer at a, a response to uh, a records request searches the records, prepares a fee estimate, and the record the requester decides not to go forward with the request. Yet, under the language of the regulations, that still could potentially be uh, denied any future requests. So we think it's really critical that there be specifically enumerated both um, you know, the more technical pieces when a fee was waived or prohibited according to the statute or <coughs> other regulations or a court judgment, but also in just the very prosaic situation that we think will happen more often, 
where somebody didn't ever agree to pay the fee, yet the record uh, holder, you know, did go through some work, but to prepare the fee estimate yet and wants to recoup that cost, which actually under the statute they're not allowed to do. So, um, so there are some changes there. Um, so we've highlighted a couple of different issues and I'll turn to Bob for a little bit more important. <laughs> they're all important. Uh, Morning. My, my name is Bob Ambrogi, and I represent the Massachusetts Newspaper Publishers Association, and we represent all the, the newspapers of the state. And as Gavi said, we had all been very much involved in uh, the process of, of bringing this law into fruition. Um, and uh, you know, I just wanted to start by by commending your office for uh, your, your speedy action in, promul in promulgating these draft regulations and uh, for. Uh, coming up with a set of regulations that I think largely uh, do reflect the, the letter and the spirit of the new law. It hasn't been an easy process, as some have already alluded to. Um, I, I think it, it, it's important to kind of emphasize just the importance of what we're doing here today, because it's, it's you know, this is the first major rewrite of our public records law in more than four decades, and these regulations will really be the key to implementing uh, those regulations, putting them into effect, I mean, putting the law into effect. Uh, and, you know, for that reason, I think it's important that the regulations do two things. One is that they uh, comply and follow the law that, under which they're being promulgated uh, so that they're not going to be subject to challenge later down the road. And also that they uh, be as clear as possible so that government officials and members of the public can follow them and work under them. Uh, I think you've done a good job in that. We, we do think our, our red lines help move it even closer to that goal of, of making sure that the, that the uh, regulations comport with the law and are a little bit more understandable and a little bit clearer for those who have to work under them. Uh, the, the part I really wanted to address today that I, I, I am uh, very concerned about uh, it, is uh, the process for uh, when a uh, what the regulations provide for when an appeal is considered to be uh, received by the uh, supervisor's office. Uh, the law, the statute, is, is very clear uh, that uh, the supervisor is to issue a determination uh, within 10 working days after uh, an appeal is received, a petition is received. Uh, the regulations uh, have, we uh, worked that to uh, kind of redefine receive as when it's assigned an appeal number by the uh, supervisor's office. Uh, I, I, we are concerned that that could be uh, misapplied or misconstrued to extend uh, the time by which a response is to be given almost infinitely because uh, there's nothing in the regulations that address when an appeal number will be given to a petition. Uh, I, I, we think the law is clear and unambiguous here that receipt uh, means receipt and that the point at which the uh, petition is filed with the uh, uh, supervisor's office, that is when it is received and the law also is uh, clear and unambiguous in using the mandatory language of shall issue a determination within 10 uh, business days from then. Uh, so there really isn't room for uh, for extending that time, and I think the regulations as they're written do not, uh, do not comply with the law as it's, required, as it's written. Another component to that same uh, provision, uh, this is 32.09, is, is uh, that 32.09 provides that the supervisor's office may refuse to accept petitions under certain circumstances. Again, I don't think uh, the law allows that. Again, the law is very clear that it says the supervisor's office shall issue a disposition within a certain number of days on all petitions. It doesn't allow the supervisor's office to uh, pick and choose the petitions that it will accept. The grounds that you've enumerated, I think, could be grounds for denying a petition after it's been accepted. Uh, and, and that's perfectly appropriate. So we've suggested uh, rewording of that section that says basically that the petition is received when it's received, not when a number is assigned to it, uh, and that the grounds that you've enumerated for refusing to adopt one could rather be grounds for uh, denying a petition after it's been documented and received. 
So I think that's it. Um, I, I, I just, for the record, my name is Pam Lomata, and I'm the second director of Common Cause, Massachusetts. So we know. Say Great. That <laughs> Great. And uh, thank you very much. And I believe you already gave uh, the written testimony to yes. some. All right, great. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. We actually have two documents we've given you. We've given you a written okay, testimony good. and a red line right. uh, set of regulations. Great, thank you. All right, before the next person, why don't I say, I think there's some more room now here, so if anyone wants to come in. Uh, yeah. All right, so the next person is uh, Diane Kane McGonigal. No, this isn't being uh, transcribed by anyone in our office. So you're you're just keeping track of comments. Oh. Exactly. Yeah, as they come in. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Whenever you're ready. Hi. How are you? Good. First of all, I'm not an attorney. I'm not part of the press. Mm -hmm. I'm just a Massachusetts resident uh, resident that feels very strongly that uh, your records are broken. And I'd first like to thank Maya from the Bay State Examiner and Dick Boston for telling my story. Uh, my, my story um, might be minded to some people, but it, it's very important to me. Um, I'd like to start by saying for a year and a half, um, the Quincy Police Department cited false reasons and lies to deny me access to a police report that I was entitled to. <coughs> I was entitled to this police report because I was the caller of the crime and also the witness of the crime. I witnessed a grown man urinating, he's a local um, comedian, on a public beach next to a public playground at 4 o'clock on a summer afternoon. The exemptions that the police chief, Paul Keenan, cited were all lies. He cited the privacy exemption, the investigatory, investigatory exemption, they also claimed that medical information was part of the report, which is not true. All of these claims were lies. An anonymous person sent me a copy of the police report, and everything that the Quincy Police Chief claimed were out and out false claims. There were no investigatory, or there was no investigation because the urinate of the local comedian admitted on the police report that he was guilty. They claimed that they were that there were sexual innuendos as part of the police report. That was also not true. They also claimed the privacy exemption, not true. I had no problem identifying myself as a witness. I did this on video at the Quincy Police Department saying that that should not apply to me. And that was also a part of their um, exemption to the Secretary of State. My story shows how corrupt the system is and how broken your laws are in obtaining a public uh, record that I was entitled to from the very beginning. The mass record laws, uh, to me, were a joke, and I feel corrupt. My suggestion to stop and, fall and, and to stop false exemptions and lies would be, instead of just the Secretary of State and you people determining the status of a public records request, maybe some people from Massachusetts, some residents, could be a part of it. Look at, listen to people like me that know from the very beginning that the other side was lying and I was being honest, and maybe they can be a part of this process. Um, I feel, I feel like that um, you just totally believe the Quincy Police Department. Uh, maybe urinating in, in public is not a big deal. I wanted to expose this person to the parents of the playground where these children play, the beach where these children swim. It was not the first time that this person committed this crime. Other people arrested for this crime if it happened in front of City Hall. I felt strongly that those parents <coughs> had the right to know. Um, i just like to know how many other people are being denied under false exemptions and false lies, and where is the fairness for me as a taxpayer and as a Quincy resident? And that's my, that's my story. Um, you can find part of my story um, on, on Bay State Examiner. I wish you would really take a look at it because, um, as a, I, again, I'm not an attorney, I'm not part of the press, but I think this is important to say that this happens and it probably happens more often than not. So thank you very okay. much. Thank I you. Thanks it. for coming. Thank you. thank you. Okay. Now we get, uh, next person on the list, Andrew Cormier. Uh Hi. Hey. How are you doing? 
And Andrew, as you said, and I'm an independent journalist. My work is in a lot of different places. Um, <clears throat> I co-founded the Bay State Examiner, and I'm in Dick Boston. I write for a site in Florida called Photography is Not a Crime, and a few other publications. Uh, some of my work is funded by the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism, and I write a bi-weekly, usually, column about public records. And um, I, some of my concerns have already been raised. I think one of the biggest ones is with the appeals process. I think it was uh, Bob and Broji who talked about it. Um, the appeals process, uh, as anyone who's ever actually used it knows, can take weeks, it can take months. Uh, sometimes for really simple appeals, and the legislature, which unanimously, both houses unanimously passed this update, um, they, they wanted you guys to only take 10 days to close appeals, which is 10 business days, so that's two weeks. That's a fairly generous amount of time. I mean, uh, an appeal shouldn't take as long as closing a public records request because you don't have to produce any documents, you just have to write a letter, which is the same thing that an agency has to do they have to write a letter that spells out their legal reasoning. So there's really no excuse for it to take a <coughs> substantial amount of time. Um, and what you guys have done is in your proposed regulations said that the 10 days won't start until you know you open the appeal when you assign it an appeal number. And in my experience, that can take more than a week. Sometimes you guys just ignore us when we email you and we have to follow up multiple times. And it's really frustrating that with the legislature unanimously passing this bill, it seems like the Secretary of State's office is trying to circumvent <coughs> the will of our legislature. And there's no excuse for that. I mean, when it says that you need to respond to a public <coughs> records request in this many days, your regulations aren't confused about that. I mean, there's a couple quibbles about that. You know, should it start the next day or the day of? But you didn't say that you know the um, agency gets to assign a public records request number and the, you know whenever they feel like it, and then take the, the countdown starts, and that's really completely unacceptable and needs to be changed. And the other thing is the um, uh, law says that you shall open any uh, appeal, and your regulations just say what the old regulations say. They say that it's up to the discretion of the supervisor of records, and that's also completely unacceptable. And you need to open every appeal and close it in 10 days. There's absolutely no excuse for you to not be doing this. That is why one of the reasons this law was passed. And I really hope you guys are going to fix that because it's it's really outrageous. There, there's We've had one of the worst public records laws in the country for decades. And for you to take some of the progress we made in this law, which for the record, in many ways actually makes it harder to get records, for you to take one of the few good things in it and to just you know, throw it out in the garbage, that's totally unacceptable. And if that is still in the regulations when they go forward, you should be ashamed of yourself. I really hope you fix it. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the, the next person is Adam Friedman. Are you ready? All right. Yeah, I'm not formally affiliated with any press or, or um, government agency. Or I'm, a, I'm a civic technologist, um, senior web software engineer. Uh, I'm president of a company called Severa, Severa Software. Uh, our first product has been, some, mm -hmm. some folks in this room might be familiar with it, it's the first um, comprehensive historical database of election results. And that's the secretary's online comprehensive database. Uh, it's been going for a couple of years now, and it's been a very successful project, tech project. So what I've been looking for are opportunities to help your office improve workflows, efficiencies, and also help the public, obviously, access information more freely. And I sent a submission to the conference committee on the public records law with the, with the suggestion um, that uh, you look into a statewide FOIA tracking software, statewide FOIA tracking database. Uh, when people make public records requests, currently the, 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 the new laws in, in sections 9E and 9F in particular, they require every single records access officer of every single government agency to independently document nine pieces of information about every single request. 
and then also require the supervisor of records to collect this information annually. And it seems like a, you know, we have so many opportunities with open source web technology to create rational systems that consolidate this stuff, put it together in one place, so that it's, we don't constantly have this balkanized thing where everyone's doing the exact same thing 351 times in the case of town clerks or you know, dozens and dozens of times of every other government agency. And um, so I've done a little bit of preliminary research. Uh, the technology at, you know, at well, there's, there's two things to think about. One is the, is this, uh, does this, if you wrote regulations that require um, records access officers to use a, a consolidated online system, are you exceeding your statutory obligations to the point where you're kind of roving out of what you're supposed to be doing in terms of boiling that down to regulations? My understanding is no. Um, my read of the, of the law is no in that uh, it's perfectly fine because you're tasked with creating guidance and forms, such as online forms, for records access officers to do what they're doing uh, to, to keep track of this information. So you can create a form online. Everyone has to use the same form online to track that. Once you do that, every request that gets submitted by the public is put online for any subsequent requester to see. Uh, and hopefully if you could add to that, uh, when a request is fulfilled by an agency or not, but when it's fulfilled, uh, you can attach that document, and so subsequent requests don't have to burden that staff uh, with with that with, with a repeat uh, repeat workflow. Uh, so I can point to three available. So the technology is out there as well. Um, there's three available FOIA tracking platforms I've seen that could serve as the state's official statewide system. Uh, all three that I've found are public interest software projects with dedicated customers. They have zero or nominal licensing fees. And in my estimate, they can be set up in fewer than six months and for less than $30,000 in engineering labor costs to customize just a small portion of logic to fit our specific public record statute, regulations, and fee structure. So the first one that many in, in this room are, I'm sure are familiar with, and you must be, Muckrock. Uh, for the past six years, They've been the FOIA management platform of choice for thousands of Massachusetts citizens as it is. It already comes preloaded with auto messaging to every public records custodian in the state, whether it's a state or local government ent entity, as well as request and response logic tailored to the Commonwealth's particular legal requirements. And to date, the system has successfully processed more than 21,000 requests from around the U.S., not just from within Massachusetts, but going to uh, various entities in Massachusetts. And then there's a few other ones that I've submitted, uh, Ala Vitelli, which is a, the FOIA platform of choice for over 25 jurisdictions, including several European national governments. This is being used at the national level. So this stuff is happening. Uh, it's, it's, it's doable. Uh, record Track is another one. Uh, it's a, record Track is now produced for open public use by Code for America. It's currently deployed in the city of Oakland. Uh, and on January 1st, the state of West Virginia actually built their own statewide uh, public request tracking system that every entity in the state has to use. If West Virginia could do this within a period of months, internally, I think it's the secretary's office with, I don't know, I think $30 million budget or so, I think they can handle it. And uh, so I've, I've submitted some of the specifics for you. Uh, I don't know, I, I know this isn't like a two-way thing, but I'd really like to know how much you know about it or you've met with Mike Morrissey or? I, uh, unfortunately, I really just can't comment on that at this point. Uh -huh. um, I really just, my role is just to hear your, your comments uh -huh. and, and take any written testimony and uh, okay. any subsequent questions you have, you know, you can raise later on. Okay. Just I, like this, I mean, okay, thank you. I will say problem. one one additional thing. The secretary, in, during the conference committee, the secretary did, did uh, submit <laughs> some testimony, of course, and said that this would be a you know, some kind of vague terminology like this would be challenging for the state to pull together or something. And I, I just like to completely dispatch with that notion because it's okay. it's not it's not true. Yeah. Understood. Okay. Okay. I can Thank take you. your written. Yeah, I've submitted it. Okay. To, to your assistant. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. And that is uh, that's everyone who's on this list. But if anyone has come in since I circulated this and would like to to uh, give some oral testimony. Actually, at this point, probably just raise your hand, and we can we can go from there. Um, but if not, 
that seems to be it, at least right now, for who wants to give oral testimony. So, with that being said, I think I'm going to wrap Purple. this up. And we are, like, let me just say, we, we can also so, take some written testimony as well. Right now, we're saying until 1 o'clock today. So, you know, as soon as you can, get in that written testimony, and we'll, we'll take that into account when we're looking at our regulations. But, again, thank you very much for coming. Hopefully it was a, a good experience, and I appreciate all your input. And so does this whole office. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your viewership, and if you found this reporting valuable, please like and share it. You can find more of our reports on BayStateExaminer.com. Links to our website, Facebook page, and Twitter are on the channel banner. And please consider donating so we can continue to expand our coverage.